stripped away by the power of your love. Hold me close, let your Good morning. Welcome to worship at Cornerstone Faith Community Church. We are so glad you have gathered together with us this morning. Will you please stand and join me in a responsive worship? In you, Lord, we put our trust. We trust in you. Never let us be put to shame. Show, Show us, us your, ways, your ways, Lord. Teach us your paths. Guide us in your truth and, and teach, teach us. us. For, For you, God, are God, our Savior. And, and our hope is in you all day long. Remember, Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from old. Do not remember the sins of our youth and our rebellious ways. According to your love, remember us, for you, Lord, are good. Good, good and upright is the, the Lord our God. God. He instructs sinners in his ways. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. Guard our life and rescue us. 
Do not let us be put to shame, for we take refuge in you, O God. Amen. Amen. Let's sing this morning about the voice in the dark that lights up the stars and that lights up our hearts this morning. One voice in the dark, a song that lights up the stars. One breath that gives life, one sovereign in power who speaks with thunder and fire.
Please be seated. This morning's scripture reading is from 1 Chronicles 29, verses 10 through 13. Praise be to you, Lord, the God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor, for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. comes the good news for us.
Father, what a love, what a cross for us. Lord, the beauty and the majesty of that cross, the power that caused the ground to tremble, that caused the veil to be torn into two, that caused the table to break, that broke the bondage, that broke the curtain, that that covered our eyes, that opened the way for us to see you fully. No more, Father, did we need a man or a mediator to go behind the curtain for us. You opened it so that we could see you face to face. That we could stand there at the foot of the cross of Jesus. And we could be healed. And Father, we're reminded that on that very day, at that very hour, the Savior looked to the thief and he said, not tomorrow, not a week from now, not a year from now, but this very day, you will be with me in paradise. Father, thank you for that kind of amazing love, that kind of guardian, that kind of keeper, one who would so love us that that very day, that very moment, we would be reunited back with you. That's the power of the cross, Father, and we thank you this morning for the way that you saw fit to make us whole and redeem us through the power of that cross. Father, now will you take our words and our thoughts and our actions in the place, and will you use them as glory to you? Will they be a joyful noise lifted up before you this morning for the sake and in great thankfulness and appreciation? for the cross of Jesus. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. And the church said, amen. Amen. Well, good morning once again. Welcome to Cornerstone Faith Community Church. We are so glad uh, to be gathered together with you for worship this morning. If you are here for Sunday school, uh, now is the time to make your way to the back of the sanctuary. Miss Lori is there, ready and waiting to take you to Sunday school. All right. Let me just uh, take a couple minutes to remind you of uh, some things that are happening in the life of the church are coming up. Uh, we have our Lenten dinner and discussion series that is ongoing, meets every Wednesday beginning at 6 p.m. Um, this week, uh, usually a fan favorite, so, so maybe everybody will come out of the woodwork this week and we'll have, you know, more people than we can feed. But uh, we have our Italian fest or Italian fest, you know, us Northwesterners call it Italian fest, right? But um, <laughs> uh, we're going to have some great Italian food uh, this Wednesday evening starting at 6 p.m. Uh, Mastacholi, uh, ra ravioli, uh, sausage and peppers, uh, meatballs. It's going to be, if you, if you, we'll probably have to roll everybody out of here. That's the point. So um, it'll be a wonderful time of uh, fellowship and then study begins at 645 or thereabouts. So we'd love to have you join us for that. We just have two weeks left in that series. Um, and so we want to, we if you haven't participated yet, it's not too late. You can come and participate with us. We'd love to have you. Also, this coming uh, Sunday, one week from today, believe it or not, is Palm Sunday. And so we will have our pancake breakfast that starts at 8.30 a.m. Uh, please come and enjoy some great breakfast and then come in here for worship. And hopefully we will have a rousing message so that you won't be all full and fall asleep, right? But um, it will be a great time of worship. We would love to have you join us uh, starting at 8.30 a.m. next Sunday for the pancake breakfast. And then we'll make our way here for worship at 10 a.m. as normal. Uh, in just two weeks' time, we have our Good Friday service. 
Uh, that happens on Friday, April 7th, uh, beginning at 7 p.m. This is our dramatic presentation. Um, it is a come, uh, sit, and absorb and experience uh, opportunity for you all. Um, the worship team has really been working hard, and we started putting all the kind of like final pieces together this week. And let me tell you, I think it's going to be very moving. It's going to be very cool. So please join us for that. Uh, this uh, That's uh, Friday, April 7th, 7 p.m. And then uh, Easter morning, Sunday, April 9th, beginning at 10 a.m., is our regular worship time, but not a regular service. This is an Easter morning celebration service. Come ready to sing and shout and rejoice for all that the Lord has done for us. Um, that takes place at our normal time, 10 a.m., Sunday morning, Easter, uh, April 9th. Um, also, coming up after Easter, Saturday, April 15th, is uh, Feed My Starving Children. We'll be serving at the Schaumburg location. If you haven't had a chance to sign up yet and you are planning to go, please do sign up as soon as you can. The sign-up sheet is available at the information uh, desk in the Welcome Center. Um, we begin our shift at 11.30 a.m., and it goes till when? 1 o'clock? Yeah, 11.30 till 1. Uh, we have to be there at 11.15 a.m., no later than 11.15 uh, in Schaumburg at Feed My Starving Children. I also just want to make uh, a note. We don't have a slide for it this morning, but uh, the following Saturday, April 22nd, we are planning an outdoor work day. Uh, we are going to focus on the east side of our building. Um, we have uh, some brush and, and shrubs and trees and things that need to be taken care of uh, at the edge of the parking lot um, to get that ready for easier cleanup for the summer. Um, and there's a, I noticed this week there's a few other things on this side of the building we need to take care of as well. So there will be some work uh, to do on the east side of the building. That will start at 9 a.m. on uh, the 22nd, April uh, 22nd. All right. Uh, anything else this morning? I think that's it. In your bulletins, you have the prayer list for this week. Please, um, we encourage you to put that someplace where you're going to see it on a regular basis. Uh, you know, uh, someone mentioned to me one time that I always say you should put it like on your bathroom mirror or something like that where you're at every day. And then they said, you should tell people to put it in their Bibles and then they would have to open their Bibles every day. And I thought, that's a, not a terrible idea either. So, you know, one place or another, um, we would love to have you joining us in prayer for those things this week. But will you just join me in a general word of prayer this morning? Father God, Thank you for this great day that you have given to us. And Father, even though it's uh, gloomy and chilly outside this morning, there is the sense of spring in the air. And uh, we are so looking forward, Father, to the day of resurrection. We're looking forward first to celebrating that day of resurrection in a couple of weeks with our brothers and sisters. And Lord, we begin praying even now that you would bring new faces to this place folks who are ready and eager to hear the name of Jesus and receive him. Father, we recognize that on Easter morning you may bring folks who have never heard the name of Jesus, have never contemplated him, have never accepted him, and so we pray that you just begin preparing this place to receive folks uh, who may be hearing the message of Jesus for the first time. And Father, we also, of course, look forward to the great day of resurrection when we will be gathered together with you forever. And we recognize that in the meantime, Father, we have a lot of work to be done. There are many who do not know your name. There are many who do not know of your salvation, your grace and your mercy. And so we pray that you would make us bold to share the name of Jesus every day at every opportunity. We pray that you would make us, like Timothy said, that we would be prepared in season and out of season to speak your name, to proclaim the name of Jesus. We pray that our lives would be an example of Jesus every single day. And Father, even as we pray that our lives would be an example of you, we are reminded that in so many ways, so often, Father, we veer from what you would have for us. Instead of walking the path of righteousness, we walk our own path. We sin against you in our thoughts and in our words and in our deeds. And so we ask for your forgiveness this morning. For us, for our brothers and sisters, for the whole church on earth. Father, we ask for your forgiveness for those who don't even know you yet. 
that as they come into your, that as you come into their hearts, they would then be drawn to the cross to seek your forgiveness. And Father, this morning we raise before you the names that are on our prayer list, names that uh, we have named before you and others that we've only named in our hearts. Your word reminds us that before we even speak a word, you already know the need. And so, Father, we lay these folks before you and we ask that you would be the great healer, the great physician. Father, that you would see folks through surgeries and recoveries. That you would be with folks as they are um, enduring cancer treatments. That you would be with those who are in desperate need, whether it be food or shelter, clothing. We pray that you would provide for those who have great financial need. Pray that you would be in all of our relationships, Father. And this morning, Lord, we give you thanks for this place, for this people that you have called Cornerstone Faith Community Church. And Father, we give you thanks that you continue to fill this place with hearts that are eager for you, for your word, and for the love of Christ. And so, Father, now as we turn our hearts to your word, we ask that you would give us the wisdom and the discernment of your Holy Spirit in this place. That this word would fall fresh on our hearts, that we would receive it well, and that we would apply it to our lives and our hearts. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, brothers and sisters, I would ask that you would stand for the reading of God's word this morning, that as we contemplate God's word this morning, it would fall fresh on our hearts, that we would give it its fullest authority in our hearts and in our lives. Continuing in the account of Ruth and Naomi and Boaz, we turn to chapter 3 this morning, beginning in verse 1. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word for this day. One day, Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, said to her, My daughter, I must find a home for you where you will be well provided for. Now Boaz, with whose women you have worked, is a relative of ours. Tonight he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash, put on perfume." Get dressed in your best clothes, then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know that you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. I will do whatever you say, Ruth answered. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man. He turned, and there was a woman lying at his feet. Who are you, he asked. I am your servant, Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a guardian redeemer of our family. The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all that you ask. All the people of my town know that you are a woman of noble character Although it is true that I am a guardian redeemer of our family, there is another who is more closely related than I. Stay here for the night, and in the morning, if he wants to do his duty as your guardian redeemer, go, let him redeem you. But if he is not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Lie here until morning. So she laid at his feet until morning, but got up before anyone could recognize. And he said, No one must know that a woman came to the threshing floor. He also said, bring me the shawl you are wearing and hold it out. When she did so, he poured into it six measures of barley and placed the bundle on her and placed the bundle on her. Then he went back to town. When Ruth came to her mother-in-law, Naomi, she asked, how did it go, my daughter? Then she told her everything Boaz had done for her. And added, he gave me these six measures of barley, saying, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Then Naomi said, wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens. For the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Brothers and sisters, uh, one night, as a soldier was standing guard at his post, in the wee hours of the morning, he heard a sudden crashing sound. He looked over his shoulder and he saw a young man attempting to scale a brick wall that was around the military camp. Stop right there, the soldier yelled across the lawn, but the young man, scared for his life, kept trying with all of his might to climb that wall. The soldier ran across the lawn, jumped up and grabbed onto the 
man's shirt tail, causing him to come crashing down to the ground. Let me go, let me go, the young man cried. After the soldier had secured the young man with the handcuffs, he began to question him as to why he was trying to scale the camp wall. He came to find that the young man, a new recruit to the army, was desperately homesick. And he had planned to run away from his station in the army. He had no concern for being listed as A-W-O-L, away without leave. That status would mean something incredible for the rest of his life, but he didn't care. He merely wanted to go home. So the soldier guarding the wall spent the rest of the night sitting along that wall, arm around the young man, while the man cried and recalled the love he had for his home. After nearly three hours had passed and the sun was about to break the horizon, the soldier asked the would-be escapee, now, don't you think you'd better hurry back to your bunk before your platoon commander awakes? Because if he sees that you've left your bunk, you'll have more than homesickness to be concerned about. The young man, knowing full well that the soldier's duty was to report him, asked him, why would you be so kind to me? Why would you protect someone who is breaking the rules? The soldier replied, my job is to be a guardian of this camp. That includes everything within the walls of this camp, including you. Now, I think you made a rash decision, and I think that the decision that you made was a result of great sadness. But we've worked through that tonight, you and I. And I doubt very much you'd make this same kind of rash decision again in the future. So, I haven't shirked my duties. In fact, I think I've been very faithful to my job description. I've guarded you from doing something that you will regret the rest of your life. Brothers and sisters, guardians come in so many different shapes and sizes for so many different moments and reasons in our lives. We've all heard of those moments with guardian angels who seem to be a protector sent from God, the, the protection that they give over us in some critical moment is, is otherwise inexplicable. We've heard of legal guardians too, haven't we? Legal guardians who come to the rescue of orphaned children, saving them from the difficult life as a ward of the state. By the way, if you've ever watched a soccer match or a hockey game, you've seen the task of the goalkeeper on display, protecting the goal, guarding the goal from the scoring attempts of the other team. Guardians come in so many different forms for so many different reasons. No matter what kind of guardian we're talking about, though, every single kind of guardian must fulfill the same basic obligation. A guardian is one who is tasked with the defense of, the protection of, and the keeping of some appointed person, place, or material. Did you notice that there are three important objectives used in that description of a guardian? They, they must be first a defender, second a protector, and finally a keeper. When I was in junior high school, one of the most sought after school supplies at the beginning of every year was a brand new trapper keeper. Can I get an amen from some of the people in the sanctuary this morning? Yeah, okay. These were, at the end of the day, just overgrown and expensive three-ring binders. But they were not just three-ring binders. They were the ultimate three-ring binder. If you were lucky enough to be granted the, the fanciest of these three-ring binders, your trapper keeper included such super cool designs, like you can see on the front cover of this one, balloons and rainbows, they had customizable dividing tabs. They had a pencil pocket. They had a ruler that you could snap right into the three-ring binder. 
they even had a small calculator right inside the front pocket so you could cheat on your math test. (laughs) Why were these binders so incredibly popular? I mean, all of the other kids in school just had regular old three-ring binders. They would be constantly picking up their papers off of the floor because they fell out. They didn't have that little flap to keep everything safely tied up inside. They would be picking up papers and pencils and other items that fell out of their standard binders. But if you had a trapper keeper, you could rest confidently knowing that your items, no matter how sloppily kept inside of that trapper keeper, were safe and sound, locked inside your fancy storage device. The name was appropriate, by the way. Everything that you needed was trapped, kept inside of that binder. I'm talking to the people about my age. These were really the guardians of our lives, were they not? I mean, how many notes from boyfriends and girlfriends were kept in the pockets of these binders? This morning, as we continue along the journey with Naomi and Ruth, we find ourselves picking up the story the morning after Ruth had come to find great success in the fields of Boaz. Her conversation with Naomi was one of great hope. Ruth had been given an identity, a protection of the fields of Boaz. Naomi was now on a mission. A mission to be sure that this identity, this protection, this provision from Boaz would be guarded just as Boaz was guarding them and taking them out of their widowhood. If we were to just pick up the account of Ruth and Boaz this morning in chapter 3, we might wonder if Naomi isn't suggesting something just a little bit risque for Ruth. It sounds as if Naomi is suggesting that Ruth would go to Boaz, make sure that he has plenty to eat and, of course, to drink. Then, once he has fallen asleep, slip into bed with him and, quote, make certain that he has a desire to protect us forever. Wink. Wink. It sounds as if this is a scene out of the musical Fiddler on the Roof when the young daughter of Tevia, Zidal, sings about the matchmaker, the local matchmaker. You remember? Matchmaker, matchmaker, make me a match. Find me a find, catch me a catch. Matchmaker, matchmaker, look through your book and make me the perfect match. On some level, that sort of is what Naomi is doing and suggesting here, but instead of some kind of sexually charged, uh, self-involved scheme, what Naomi is actually asking from Ruth is a culturally appropriate, timely means of showing Boaz that Ruth is both ready and willing to take the relationship to the next level. But Naomi's suggestions, Ruth's actions, they are never uncouth. They are purposeful, they are thought out, they are a bit covert, sure, but they are never forward, they are never inappropriate, they are never more sensual than one would expect of a young widow speaking to the man who might just be God's perfect match for her. The actions that Naomi suggests that Ruth would take in verses 3 through 4 indicate a marriage proposal. Ruth is demonstrating that she is done mourning and she is ready for new life. If we were to see Ruth and Naomi face to face at this time with our own eyes, we would almost assuredly have seen them draped in black. Their underskirts would be black, their coats would be black, their shettles that's the covering, head covering that a Jewish woman would wear, would have been black. They were women in mourning. They both lost their husbands. But they were women in mourning until that mourning was replaced with joy. And so they would demonstrate the mourning by the way they dressed. But now, Naomi says, it is time for Ruth to throw off the mourning clothes, the funeral clothes, pack away the black dress, and adorn herself with hope, the hope of Boaz and a new life together. 
Tony Evans, Pastor Tony Evans writes this. He says, through her words and her actions, Ruth was making a marriage proposal. She was requesting that Boaz perform his legal responsibility as a family redeemer. By asking him to take her under his wing, Ruth was reminding him of the blessing he had pronounced on her previously. Ruth was challenging him to become the human expression of God's divine covering. Perhaps actually what Pastor Evans has in mind here by God's divine covering is the same thing that King David had in mind in Psalm 91 when he said, whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. And then David goes on and he says, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I shall trust. Surely he will save me from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover me with his feathers. And under his wings I shall find my refuge. His faithfulness shall be my shield and my rampart. The biblical theological study Bible notes this. It says, here's a better understanding of this appropriate and telling move on Ruth's part. Ruth is secretly to fold back the skirt of Boaz's long tunic, exposing the area around the feet. And she is to lie down there. These proposed actions seem very forward, but in fact involve no moral compromise by either Ruth or Boaz. The exposure of Boaz's feet to the night chill would awaken him at the best moment for a private conversation. More important, the gesture symbolizes Ruth's willingness to marry Boaz. Ruth is ready to be done with her sorrow. She is ready to be past her grief. She no longer desires to be seen as one who has been so so radically impacted by death at such a young age, but instead she hopes to be seen as one who now exhibits the utter joy that one has when they have a life to live. So brothers and sisters, if you can't see the allusion to Jesus our Savior, in this statement, then perhaps you've not fully understood the joy and the life that Jesus brings. Without the Savior, we are like Ruth. We may as well adorn ourselves with grief and with sorrow and black, but with Jesus, death gives way to life. Defeat gives way to victory. If Jesus is your savior, then why would you adorn yourself with grief? Jesus gives you the opportunity to wear joy instead. The apostle Paul confirms this in his letter to the Corinthians, chapter 15, starting in verse 51. He says, listen, I I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet sound. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. And when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, the mortal with immortality, then the saying that has been written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. For where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, there was a hymn written in the 1700s, actually, that probably communicates this same idea very well. I don't know how many would be familiar with this, but here's the words. It says, soul, adorn thyself with gladness. Leave behind all gloom and sadness. Come into the daylight splendor. There with joy thy praises render. Unto him whose grace unbounded hath this wondrous supper founded. High o'er all the heavens he reigneth, yet to dwell with thee he deigneth. The second verse says this, Hasten as a bride to meet him. With loving reverence greet him, for with words of life immortal, now he knocketh at thy portal. Haste to open the gates before him, saying, While thou dost adore him, suffer, Lord, that I would receive thee, and I never more shall leave thee. 
Ruth's actions seem a bit strange to us. She sneaks into her master's room. And she is there at night. She lays down beside him in hopes of waking him up by uncovering his feet. But in Ruth's day, it was her way that she is suggesting to Boaz something beautiful. I am ready to be done with my past. I am ready to be past the grief. And I am ready to live new life with you. Imagine that conversation with Jesus. I am ready to be done with my past. I am ready to be past my grief. I am ready to live new life with you. This powerfully leads us to this conclusion. I think that Ruth's request for Boaz to spread his blanket over her or his tunic over her. By the way, sometimes you'll see blankets, sometimes you'll see tunic because at night a man wouldn't sleep with his tunic on. He would usually take it off and actually use it as a blanket. So Ruth's request for Boaz to spread his blanket over her was a request of two parts. First, she was asking him to marry her. And secondly, she was asking once again for his protection. I once heard a pastor suggest that there may be an unwritten understanding hidden within the words of verse 9 of our text. When Ruth asks Boaz to cover her with the corner of his garment, she is, in fact, asking him to spread out his wings of protection over her. In the same way that the tunic or the blanket would protect her from the cold night air, probably the bugs as well, she says, spread your feathers out over me and protect me. Husbands and wives in the room this morning, I pray that you all have had this experience at least once in your life. On a cold, snowy Sunday afternoon, two of you sit down on the sofa side by side. Your spouse takes the blanket that they have so nicely warmed up and they spread it over you and you go, oh, it's so nice and warm. You immediately feel the warmth of two bodies rather than just one. So you both scooch just a little bit closer to each other. And in that moment, there is this warmth, this, this joy, this safety, this protection. That simple Afghan somehow seems to have taken on this bulletproof nature for your marriage and relationship. And so Ruth asks Boaz to share the garment with her. She is simultaneously asking three other things. Will you share your warmth with me? Will you share your joy with me? Will you share your protection with me? So often at weddings, I am asked to read from the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 4. It says, there was a man who was all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling, he asked, and why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too is meaningless, a miserable business. For two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help him up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. The cord of three strands is not quickly broken. When two lie down together, there is help, there is support, there is warmth, there is defense. Ruth pulled back the corner of Boaz's garment, and in doing so, she asked his permission to lie down beside him, together, next to him, to be his help, to be his support, for him to support her, to keep each other warm, and to be each other's defense and protection. Ruth's actions and Boaz's response make for one absolutely beautiful story. Boaz cautions, though, he says, listen, before we go too far, I'm not the only guardian redeemer. In fact, Naomi has a guardian redeemer who is closer than me. But if that closer relative is unwilling, Ruth, know this. I will do everything you have asked of me. 
I will redeem you, Ruth. Ruth took a serious risk that night. We cannot assume that Boaz would have been the only one asleep on that threshing floor that night. In fact, the reason that Boaz was sleeping there was to protect the harvest so that nobody would break in and and take all of the grain that had already been threshed. Surely his helpers and his workmen were there with him. Had Ruth miscalculated her movements, even just slightly, she could have awoken the other men in the room. If Ruth had stayed with Boaz just one moment too long, she could have awoken and drawn misconstrued conceptions from all of the other men. People may have misunderstood what happened between Boaz and Ruth that night. Both the reputation of Boaz and the reputation of Ruth were on the line in this moment. But even still, Ruth trusted that Naomi would not send her into a trap. She trusted that God, the same God who had provided for her so faithfully thus far, would provide for her protection one more time. And she trusted that this man, Boaz, who had been so welcoming and so compassionate towards her, thus far, he would greet her marriage proposal with that same warmth and compassion. I think that leaves us with one big takeaway this morning. One one big thing we can pull away from this. Ruth didn't offer any excuses when Naomi asked her to take a risk with Boaz. And as a result, she received the hope of redemption. Big risk, big reward. Listen once more to Boaz's words. He said to Ruth, the Lord bless you, my daughter. This kindness that you've shown me is greater than anything you've shown me before. You have not run after the younger men, with, whether they are rich or they are poor. And now, my daughter, do not be afraid, for I will do for you all that is asked of me. And all the people of the town know that you are a woman of noble character. I want you to notice that Boaz steps once again well beyond the letter of the law when it comes to this kinsman Redeemer business. He says, I will do everything that you have asked of me. And and when that all happens, the people will know immediately that you are a woman of noble character. In a traditional kinsman redeemer agreement, the redeemer was not required to be so concerned what the town thought about the one that he was redeeming. He was merely concerned with providing the means for that person to be freed from their bondage of slavery. But Boaz continues this incredible kindness towards Ruth that he has been showing. He is not a young man. By the way, there's some who would suggest he was not the most handsome man in town either. But Ruth has looked beyond her youthfulness, beyond her ability to have a young, strapping husband with all the appeal of a semi-clothed firefighter. And she has instead desired Boaz. Not for his looks, not for his age, and I would bet not even for his money. She desired him because he was kind and compassionate and faithful to his God and faithful to Naomi and faithful to Ruth. So we've witnessed this bold and courageous Ruth this morning. No excuses. No questionable motives. Just the hope that Boaz could really truly save her and that she really would receive Redemption. Brothers and sisters, this is how we must approach King Jesus, our kinsman redeemer. No excuses. No questionable motives. Just the hope of a guardian redeemer. 
No excuses. You, we, we've got to be done with things like, I just don't have the time. My kids are too involved in things at school. I, I'm afraid of what people will say about me if I'm always at church. No more excuses. And no questionable motives. We've got to get past the, well, you know, if I just go to church regularly, God will be fine with me. It'll make up for the things that I do. I just got to sit there once in a while. No more questionable motives. No more, well, if I just live a, a life that's good enough, then God will look past all the other stuff. It won't matter. Instead of excuses and questionable motives, just like Boaz, all that Jesus wants from you is to come to him with hope. Hope that he really is the one who he says he is. Hope that he really can do what he says he will do. And hope and trust in the knowledge that what he says he will do, he will do. Every time. Just the hope of our guardian redeemer. Amen? Father, thank you for a willing Boaz to cover Ruth with the hem of his garment. Lord, we are reminded of that woman who came reaching for the hem of Jesus' garment, saying, if only you will let me touch the hem of your garment, I shall be healed. What faith that woman had in the hope of her Redeemer. Father, may we too have such faith in the garment of our Redeemer. May we have such hope that you will, as your word has said, spread your feathers over us, your, your wings of protection, that you will be our refuge and our shield. Father, may we, as we prepare to witness the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, as we prepare to witness the the audacity, the, the horror of the cross of Jesus, and as we prepare to witness the beauty and the majesty, the awesome wonder of the resurrection of Jesus, may we be so bold as to simply trust and know that you are who you say you are and you do what you say you will do. And you have done for us more than we could ever think or imagine. So Father, as we prepare to see how Boaz redeems Ruth and Naomi, will you prepare us to see, Father, your Redeemer for us? Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the Lord of lords our kinsman redeemer. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you please stand and sing with us?
So brothers and sisters, the question before us as we go out into the mission field this morning is, is it more excuses? Is it more questionable motives? Or is it more love, more power, and more worship? Because you see, it can't be both. You can't come to Jesus with excuses and questionable motives and expect to have love and power. You can't come to Jesus with excuses and questionable motives and expect to be able to worship him rightly and truly. So as you go into the mission field, as you go ready to proclaim the name of Jesus, I just want you to think every morning, is it excuses and questionable motives or is it love, power, worship, and honor? Go then with the love of God our Father the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ, his son, and the power and presence of his Holy Spirit to be yours today and forever. Amen. 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 Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here Have a wonderful week, everybody.